2,500 years ago, the prophet Daniel prophesied that in the end times the Roman Empire would be revived and that the Antichrist would arise out of it. Today, we are seeing the fulfillment of this prophecy in the form of the European Union. For an analysis of this amazing development by an expert from London, England, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. This is the fifth in a series of seven programs that we're presenting regarding the signs of the times that indicate we are living in the season of the Lord's return. All the programs are featuring presentations that were made at our annual Bible conference whose theme was Living on Borrowed Time. In this program, we're going to show you a portion of the presentation about the European Union that was made by Alan Franklin, a Christian journalist from London, England. The essence of his presentation can be summed up by one sentence you will hear him speak, and that sentence is, We are sleepwalking to tyranny. And now, here is Alan Franklin speaking on the revival of the Roman Empire in the form of the European Union. Right, uh, Rome is rising, so I bring you greetings, not just from Great Britain, but from the European superstate that we flew out from on Thursday, from London, part of the European Union, where the revived Roman Empire is on fast forward. Let's see what it's doing, because as speaker after speaker has told you today, as if I'm sure you didn't know already, many of you are well aware of this, but the church out there, the world out there is unaware. We are living on the verge of the climax of world history, the return to earth, the second advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, as predicted over and over again in Bible prophecy. We've heard and we hear a lot about Israel, which is dear to our hearts because we have three granddaughters living in northern Israel, in Naharia, in the Western Galilee, with our daughter and son-in-law. And a fourth grandchild is expected in October when we'll be over in Israel helping out. Uh, our trips to Israel are a little bit different to uh, Dave's and others. We see fewer sites and more of the kitchen sink. You know, we, we help out. <laughs> It's a grand, granddad and grandma's role these days. So we, we know and love Israel. But as well as this major prophetic event, we've seen, and most people miss it even when they study prophecy, the rise of the revived Roman Empire also prophesied around 2,500 years ago. Because in Europe, the Roman Empire has returned. First advent, Rome was ruling when our Lord was on the earth. When he comes back again, Rome will again be ruling. And here is what uh, Jose Manuel Barroso, president of the European Commission, said himself. Sometimes I like to compare the EU, the European Union, to the organization of an empire. We have a dimension of empire. Very understated, but that's what they intend to build. And for years, as some of you will know, um, I've been talking and claiming that the revived Roman Empire was being created, recreated before our very eyes. And hardly anybody knew about it or would take any notice. And then one day, it was that eureka moment. And I thought, great, because they put up a big circus tent outside the parliament in Brussels, Belgium, one of the twin capitals of the European Union. You might think that's very appropriate for politicians because it was for clowns, you see. <laughs> um, Anyway, inside, the exhibition spoke of the revived Roman Empire. And I thought, great. It's not me saying it. They said it. And that really was wonderful for me. That was the title of their exhibition. And they made some bold, grand claims inside. They said, we will be renamed the Union once we grow to 50 states. There are 28 at the moment. 14 other states are hovering around in a different federation. Other people are applying to join. They're not all that far short of coming up to 50. They will move the headquarters of the, Europe, of the uh, United Nations to Europe. Hooray, you say. Good. We don't want it. 
But it's all about control. It's all about power. This is what they're all about. They want to take over from America because they say, and they said that in this exhibition, an official exhibition, this will be the European century. They will dominate the world via their enormous legal and moral reach. You might say immoral reach. So now you know. They state in advance what they're going to do. A lot of would-be tyrants have done this. For example, Hitler, when he wrote Mein Kampf, many years before the outbreak of the Second World War, stated exactly what he was going to do. Nobody took any notice. Maybe they thought he was joking. He was deadly serious. These people are serious people. They're power players. There's a man that uh, emails me from time to time, Dr. Anthony Coughlin. He's a Eurosceptic. He doesn't believe in the great project, as they call it. And when a country joins the European Union, he sends a welcoming email. He says, welcome to the EU, the prison house of nations. Once you're in, there's no escape. They've got you. And they plan to fast take over the world. They're nothing if not ambitious. Uh, here are some of the countries which are lining up to join. Uh, candidate countries, potential candidates, they range from Iceland to Turkey. And remember, it would all come under one jurisdiction, be effectively one country. Then, of course, as the Roman Empire expands into North Africa as it did, they'll be taking in African nations as well. It's a globalization process. The Organization of African Unity created an African Union, which was loosely based on the European Union, with a central bank, central court of justice, and so on. They plan an Arab common market. And then North and South America also are coming together. They used to call it the North American Union, but that sounded a little scary, so they changed it to the far uh, innocuous-sounding Peace and Prosperity Conference. Hardly anyone believes this exists, by the way. When I start to talk about it, they look at me as if I'm mad. Um, At one conference, I presented it, and Pat helped me. She does a lot of research with me. We just went down and gave them chapter and verse and pictures and wording so that the dates, the things were signed so that they could not dispute it. But people get on and watch their sport. They're not interested. You know, there's one problem that our two nations have in common. They're sedated with sport and soap operas. This gets the energy and the attention of a lot of adults and young people. This is what they're talking about in their canteens and offices. This is where their interest is. Meanwhile, behind their backs, the world is being reshaped in a rather horrible way. Because Brussels, again, plans to expand its empire. They want, and this is very interesting, see the list of nations. They want to include all the countries around the Mediterranean, from Morocco to Syria and Israel. European Russia, Ukraine, Albania, Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, countries that uh, a lot of students would be hard to find on a map, but they're not too far from the headquarters of the European Union. What they're doing is dismantling the nation state so that any one of the current 500 million citizens of the EU can legally come, live, and work in Great Britain. Many of them have, million upon million upon million of them. If you come into England now and go to any city, you'll find it absolutely overrun. Once in a while, you may see a native Brit, but not too many, especially in London. And the reason is that they have the legal right to be here. And nobody knows how many are there. And they have the right to vote in our elections. So, and you'll see it happen here, it's going to happen in America. It is happening here in America. Very similar things are happening because a lot of things in Europe are paralleled over here. And you can see the same pattern, the same hidden hand behind it. 75% of our laws now originate in the European Parliament where there is virtually no debate. MEPs, members of the European Parliament, are hardly aware of what they're voting for. Most of them just go there, press a button, claim their expenses, and go away. They vote electronically. They have a maximum of about um, 90 seconds to speak. You can't really... You couldn't actually come to a conference like this because some of us go on a bit, you know. 90 seconds, you'd hardly get started. You're just about taking a drink of water. Uh, No debate, really. They don't want debate because the Parliament has very few powers anyway. It can't propose law. It can only modify them. It's a puppet parliament. 
Members of the Union for the Mediterranean, this is the next step. The blue states are existing 27 EU members. It's actually 28 from the 1st of July when Croatia joins. The yellow states are the new partner nations all around the Med. These countries are being sucked in and gradually they have to follow the same rules, the same trade regulations, the same laws, and they have a common judicial area. And suddenly it's all merged into one great amorphous country with a central rule, very bureaucratic, very controlling. And here again is one of the keys to prophecy because we know that the man who will become Antichrist, who I believe is... uh, at large in the European Union at the moment. I don't think he's prominent. I think he's out there. He's got to be because this is going to happen very quickly. Everything is breaking down and coming together. You know, we've got a world falling apart out there, but also a world that's very rapidly coming together, huddling together, coalescing together, becoming super states. And we know that the man who will become Antichrist will sign a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. If they already have Israel in there more, under their control, it'll be very easy. The ground is being prepared. This is the official uh, document of the mission of Israel to the European Union. Because Israel will have to do as it's told if it wants to carry on trading. It's already very difficult for the Israelis to trade with the rest of the world. Many countries boycott their produce. Even in Britain, which is absolutely... uh, Uh, massive uh, population of Islamics. We've got about 5 million Islamics. 10% of the the young population is Islamic in Britain. And they boycott and they they, uh, blockade and picket stores that sell Israeli produce. Pat and I always go around. And if we see anything from Israel, we make a point of going up to the counter and saying, we bought this because it's from Israel. And we tell people that God blesses those who bless Israel. Nevertheless, Israel is going to come under increasing pressure to toe the line. And they're also talking about right now, this is going on, a free trade agreement between the EU and America. Once you have free trade, you start to get free interchange of populations. I've seen it all develop over many, many years. Uh, We had uh, one of our newspapers that we published was a business newspaper. And several of our MEPs were columnists. And uh, they invited me out once in a while to uh, listen into the debates and do some reporting and meet them and so on. So I saw it right from fairly early stages through the 80s and the 90s, how it was actually developing into a massive power block. Uh, when you've seen what they've got and the, the people behind it and the money that they've put and the expertise and the facilities they've got, they are really meaning business. It's a powerful thing. There are 28 countries as of 1st of July. And they gave me this. They said, we're a union of peace, freedom, and solidarity. It sounds wonderful. We all want peace. After the war, they thought that uh, if they kind of all merged together, they couldn't wage war. European nations for hundreds of years have waged war with each other. We fought a war with France for 100 years. We fought two world wars, as you did with Germany. So it seemed a very interesting and unusual idea. Instead of waging war, we'll come together. That's how it was soft-sold to the public. Croatia just joined. Turkey, which has 71 million Islamics, is in talks right now, but they've been going on a long time. A lot of nations don't want Turkey in because then all the Turks can come and live in London or wherever. Bosnia, Serbia, Kosovo, even Iceland are known as candidate countries. We flew out from Heathrow Airport in London on Thursday, but I didn't come out as a British citizen. I came out as a European Union citizen. This is passport control in London. Come out under the flags of Europe, not the Union Jack, which I think is very significant. I got a new passport a couple of years ago. This was my old passport. At the top of it, in the British blue that we were used to for decades, it says British passport. That's what you expect, right? Got my new Euro Burgundy passport. Right at the top of it, it says European Community. That shows that I'm number one, a citizen of the European Community, only secondarily a citizen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. They actually hold the power, and that is where the power is increasingly focused. Every uh, 9th of May, the citizens across Europe, they're trying to create the thought that we're one nation, you see. We're supposed to go out, and I I personally and Pat, we dance around the Maypole. We celebrate, (laughs) I don't think, we celebrate the building of a super state, you see, and that was uh, Europe Day, which is instituted some years ago. They're trying to clamp down 
on symbols of nationalism, like the Union Jack. That's why I make a point of wearing it to annoy them as possible, much as possible, you know. <laughs> and uh, actually, politicians, we've known a lot of politicians. Pat and I used to go up to Downing Street for the Christmas party every year. And uh, it's not true that all politicians are either stupid or evil or misguided. A lot of them are just misinformed, don't have all the facts at their uh, disposal. One of the people who is a very good politician um, is a good friend of mine, Gerald Howarth. Um, he's an MP for the Aldershot area. And uh, until recently, he was armed forces minister in the British government. And he used to give me a lot of information. And uh, he was very much of a right mind. Uh, he, he would agree with much of what has gone on in the conference. And I can say that now without bis- destroying his career because he's now not in the government. He's uh, passionately against homosexual marriage. And uh, he believes in the nation state and patriotism. And he really dislikes the EU. So obviously his future was somewhat limited. So I just kept quiet about it until he came out of the government. But uh, Gerard, Gerard um, he actually put um, a union on his number plate. That was a criminal offence under European Union law because they wanted the stars of Europe on the number plates, you see. So he came to us. We worked well together over many years. And he said, this is terrible. So I wrote the headline, it's a crime to be patriotic. You'll see that a certain Pat Franklin wrote the story and it escalated. It led to a debate in the House of Commons and people, once they were woken up, you see, people are unaware of all this. One of the jobs of this conference, one of the pe- one of the things that Dave Regan and crew do all the time is to try and alert people because people who don't know the facts are likely to fall victim to all kinds of political correctness and rubbish and be told, well, this is the truth. No, this was the truth. So we told people and people started to get outraged and the EU saw that it was on a loser. So it stepped back and that was the one battle we won. And Gerard uh, put the Union Jack on his number plate. We got some uh, Union Jacks printed and we, we sell them or give them away wherever I go usually because they've got this. When, when you get your car, it comes with a Eurostar on the back. So we encourage people to paste the Union Jack over it, you see. It's a, you know, you might think, well, that's just a little gesture, but it's quite important. Symbolic gestures are important, actually, and people respond to that. And there's quite a, a rising mood against the EU in Great Britain, but it's a bit late, I'm afraid, because we've had over 50 years of deception. Went back as far as uh, 1957, when six countries originally got together in Rome to set up what was called the common market. Now, if you've been to Europe, you've been to London or Britain, anywhere, we have street markets. People in Britain love their markets because you get, you know, interesting things, quite cheap, and the, the market traders usually have a good spiel, and it's entertaining. It's, a, it's kind of interesting to go and shop there. So we thought, market, that's a good idea. People go to France and buy cheap wine and cheese and so on, come back. They thought, that's good. And it was sold on the idea that it was just about trade. You know, it'll be good for you. When you go abroad, you won't have to change your currency. One currency will be used all across Europe. So great, the common market sounded good. Then by stealth, step by step, when people were not even looking or noticing, as I said, watching sport, soap operas and so on, this grew into the superpower called the European Union. And it was subsequently revealed and admitted by the man who got us in, Ted Heath, a traitor to Britain when he was Prime Minister, that it was never intended that this was just going to be about trade. Today, Europe has its own anthem, flag, laws, courts, army, police force, and currency. Why hasn't anyone done anything about it? Because the young generation is a brainwashed, soundbite generation. Not many would sit still for an hour-long talk. They don't seem to have that capacity to absorb detailed information. We've got to the stage that a British writer called George Orwell wrote about in a book, a famous book you will have heard of and probably read, called 1984, where the hero or central character, Winston Smith, specialised in revising history and propaganda. Well, the EU is doing this. They tried to rewrite the history of Europe. This was for a history book that was going to go out of standard issue in all the schools across Europe. And they thought, well, you know, we'll just change a few details. And they airbrushed a few minor things out of history. And do you know what that included? World War I and World War II. They never happened. 
The young people weren't going to be told about them. And do you know, they don't know about them. And uh, someone I know very well, uh, an MEP who was an independent, fought a furious battle against this, got it in the press, got it on TV. Again, they back down. They, they take one step back and two steps forward, you know. If they're exposed, uh, somehow it's like a, um, I was going to say putting salt on a snail, but, uh, you know, they, 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 sh- they shy away, they get back. But then when you're not looking, they take that step forward again. Um, they rewrite history. Words have lost their meaning. Even on national TV and major newspapers, you see that there's a very small vocabulary. We notice this because Pat and I have been editors for decades. People's vocabularies have shrunk as words vanish from our language. I mean, you hear all the time, if you ask someone what they think about something, they'll say, that was real neat. What's that supposed to mean? What a stupid phrase. What does it mean? It means nothing, you know. (laughs) Thought processes have become poorer People now seem unable to reason or analyze. There were some pupils at a very uh, prestigious school that got the top marks in its state, actually. I say state, it was a county in Britain. And uh, I was actually um, with some of these pupils one day, and I was with them quite often, actually. And I used to like to talk to the young people to find out what they knew. And these were teenage girls. And uh, I said, today we're talking about the Second World War, you see. I knew they didn't know anything about it. I guess they didn't anyway. But I didn't know the depth of their ignorance. And I said, uh, tell me about it. Who was it fought between? This is an amazing thing that happened. I wouldn't have believed it. One of them piped up after a silence. They had to think, who was the second world? That's a hard one, isn't it? You know, um, It was between Poland and England, they said. <laughs> this is true. I'm not making this up. And I said, well, Poland and Great Britain were involved, but that's not quite the whole story. And gradually I teased a few more things out of them. They didn't have a clue. They hadn't been taught anything. Goodness knows what they were taught in history classes, but it certainly wasn't history. And this is deliberate, by the way. The destruction of education is quite deliberate. We live in a country called... That woke you up, didn't it? (laughs) Made me jump a little. We live in a country called Europe. Romano Prodi said when he was president of the EU, he wants a common EU policy on foreign affairs, defense, law and order, and the power to dictate tax and spending policies. And he said, we are a grand political project and a supranational democracy. They're not any kind of democracy. They also want to directly tax all the citizens of the country of Europe. When our daughter, who lives in Israel, uh, wanted to renew her passport, a British passport, a European Union passport, it had to go to the French embassy. That's how far we're mixed and mingled, you see. Brussels, they say, will be Europe's sole representative on all international bodies, and there will be an integrated European police force. We are sleepwalking. Out there, the world is sleepwalking to tyranny. If you watch television programs that come across from Great Britain, BBC, for example, a lot of the Discovery uh, Network stuff is made in London, you find that they talk about uh, metric measure all the time, kilometers and so forth. Pounds and ounces have been banned in in Great Britain and across Europe. BC and AD are being dropped from their history books. Inexorably, this is what was said in a major newspaper, our democracy and history are being destroyed. The destruction is quite deliberate. I was once with an MEP, member of the European Parliament, in Brussels, in Belgium. Brussels is a rather quaint, picturesque old town with this monstrous carbuncle of the European Union right slap in the middle of it. And he was taking me around and we were talking and uh, I was looking at the cobbles, the little cobbled streets, Around the European Union, they were concreted over, you see. And I said, uh, why have you concreted the cobbles over? And he looked at me, he said, well, a lot of people don't like the EU, hard to believe, but some don't, you know. And they used to go there and have the occasional riot, people like uh, French farmers. He said they used to dig up the cobbles and chuck them at us. So he said, we stopped there. And he said, I'll tell you how else we've stopped it, follow me. So I walked down the road about 100 yards, 100 yards, not 100 meters. And, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm sorry, very anti-metric. And I saw these guys. They looked like lots of Darth Vaders in visors and shields, you know, very formidable force. And what was said to me was something on these lines, that if we have any trouble here in future, we'll crack a few skulls. 
This is their idea of democracy. You, you protest against them, you could be in trouble because what we're seeing is the formation of a European police state. It's the Nazi Germany remo- revived all over again. What you have just seen is only a portion of the presentation that Alan Franklin made at our conference. The entire presentation is contained in this video album, Living on Borrowed Time. In just a moment, our announcer will tell you how you can get a copy of the album. Next week, the Lord willing, we will present a portion of the presentation made by Robert Jeffress, the pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. He spoke about the impending implosion of our nation. And now, here are some closing comments from Alan Franklin. In the meantime, we have a job to do. We actually have to alert people out there. This is a lost and dying world. Bible prophecy really is not depressing. It's a ray of light. It gives hope because we know that someone else said earlier, at the end, the Lord wins. We come back to rule and reign with him from Jerusalem. But the world out there is ignorant, and many are willfully ignorant, but they can be woken up. I don't think there's going to be a a great end times revival while the church is here. Many will come to faith after we've gone. We've got to spread this work out as, as Lamb and Lion is doing now. Spread this information out while we can because a great dark time is coming like a dark blanket over Europe when we're not going to be able to speak and teach and preach as we do already in our little church. We've only got 50 or 60 people. That's a, that's actually, we're one of the liveliest churches in Britain believe it or not. Uh, at least we preach and teach the truth. We're very... <laughs> if you came to see us, you, you think it's wild. It's not the kind of place a respectable person would go. It looks more like a shed, really. But, uh, it, you know, we, we've resolved to put all our money into mission, never to waste money on a building, because we think they'll take a building off us anyway at some stage. Because what we preach is politically incorrect, but it's biblically correct, you see? That's what really matters. That's what people find so offensive, because the gospel is an offense. If you teach... Uh, what the world wants to hear, what their itching ears like to hear. You might be popular, you might write a bestseller, but you're not doing the work that God wants you to do. Because our job is not to be popular, it's to tell the truth, the whole truth, the, the Bible, the biblical truth. Get your DVD copy of the 2013 Lamb and Lion Bible Conference, Living on Borrowed Time, for a gift of $25 or more, plus the cost of shipping. The DVD album contains three DVDs, which contain all six featured speakers. In addition to Dr. David Reagan's presentation, you will receive Nathan Jones speaking on the end-time sign of technology. Ron Rhodes addresses the sign of apostasy in the church. Don McGee emphasizes the prophetic significance of Israel. Alan Franklin discusses the rise of the European Union, and Pastor Robert Jeff speaks on the impending implosion of America. Dr. David Reagan's book with the same title as the conference album, Living on Borrowed Time, is available for a gift of $15 or more plus the cost of shipping. Get both the video album and the book for a gift of $30 or more plus the cost of shipping by requesting special offer number 581. To place your order, call the number you see on the screen Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time, or order online at lamblion.com. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 